All right, today we're here with Daniel Fang, drummer from Baltimore-based hardcore band Turnstile. Is that? I think I made. I think I got all the details in there. Yeah, yeah. we were just talking about how he has a rock and roll name. And I was asking if it's actually his name. Mm-hmm. Turns out it is. Yeah. It is. Like that's it, awesome. Yeah, but I mean that's a perfect like. Oh rock and yeah, roll name. yeah. I'm jealous for sure. And you always go by <laughs> Daniel or Dan. Yeah, Daniel. Although you know, if I say Daniel, people just choose what to call me, like based on how many friends they've had named Dan or Daniel. But I got you. That's how it goes, and I'm cool with all of it. You ever go by D? See, no. I, I get, I, I <laughs> skip the Never. Tom. I skip the Tom. I go T or Thomas, and that's it. Yeah, I like that. Oh, yeah, really? I didn't. I never knew that about you. Have you ever called me anything else? I guess not, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, here we go. That was my grandma. No does that. Um, anyways. All right, but y- you play a certain instrument in the band. Yeah, I play drums. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Which is, it's a heavy drum band. It is. I feel like, uh, I feel like the drums, and I don't know if this is because Brendan, the lead singer, is also a drummer. I feel like the drums are such an integral part of Turnstile, like just to the sound in general and gives it that character I think separates it from other bands. I don't know. Do you feel that way? Um, Yeah. I mean, it's definitely representative of everyone in the band. Like most of the people in the band are drummers. Um, Brendan, like you were saying, amazing drummer uh, who played in like Trapped Under Ice, the Baltimore band that was really influential to everyone else in the band. Yeah. Um, And he's like the primary composer and songwriter. So I think drums being his first instrument uh, really affects how he approaches just the idea, the essence of a new song, and then being able to like collaborate with him and just, um, you know, us being able to speak the same language uh, is really nice when like finding out the best way a song should feel. And that feel, like I said, like usually is like rooted in like the groove and the drums. Um, So yeah, it's definitely like at the core of most turnstile songs, I think. Yeah, I and I love too that it's not just a certain style of drumming. I feel like it incorporates a bunch of different styles. I mean, I know just um, like you were saying, Thomas, you, we were watching some videos on YouTube um, about kind of your drum style. There's like go go drums. There's all kinds of influences that you take in, and I don't know what are some of the influences that kind of you've you've yeah take from over the over you know i mean i know i know exactly where i where it resonates with me and why i think i get so hyped when i hear turn style but uh interesting okay all right all right yeah i mean it kind of comes from everywhere like actively listening passively listening you know influences just kind of like naturally bleed in um but yeah gogo was a huge inspiration growing up uh closer to dc like i'm from pg county maryland originally yeah and um that was like the thing where I grew up going to public schools. Like the drummer was like the kind of focus in go-go bands. And that was like the hero (laughs) of the group. So I think naturally that was just like, um, kind of a position, kind of an instrument that people aspired to like, uh, take on or be good at in some way. Um, and then there's just everything else, which is, uh, it's just kind of something that happens where I don't think there's ever the conscious effort to like, want to incorporate all these different styles um, into a song or into an album, but more so we're naturally um, just gravitating towards lots of different types of music. And I think the goal with making music in general is to be open to, um, you know, just incorporating whatever and, trying to dissolve any any box of like a genre that mm-hmm. you may think you fit into or other people think you fit into. Yeah. Um, so just opening up the parameters of what you can do is probably our only like explicit goal is to like try to find creative freedom and try to just get to like the deepest to like um, creative like impulses that are within all of us uh, as a band and if that happens to span like a wide range of like rhythms and, and different sounds from different places, yeah, that's great. Cause I think that means just like, um, we don't feel constrained in a box in any way. Right. What I think is interesting though, is like some, some bands or songs you hear, 
the drum beat just repeats itself. So it starts, you kind of get, okay, this is going to be the beat for the song. And it kind of goes through whether that's, you know, whatever genre you want to talk about. What I kind of dig about what you do at Turnstile is like, it'll start off one direction and then it goes a complete di- different direction. Mm-hmm. And it's that thing that I love from like bands like the cult or Nirvana, where it kind of has that lulls you to sleep kind of, and then charges you back up. I don't, I don't know to how to talk music <laughs> as well as Robbie does, but like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Like the, like, I, I don't know what the songwriting term for that is, but that's why I immediately liked your song is I felt that familiarity with like that, you know, almost some of those, some of those bands. Yeah, that's super cool. And I don't think it needs a term cause it's just like the feeling or, or the energy of a song. Um, I don't think there's any formula to like making you wake up and suddenly like really excited about a, a feel change in a song. It, it's just something that we strive for to, um, to keep the energy kind of evolving and changing, especially because uh, we approach songwriting um, in terms of like, how is this going to sound live and how is this going to feel live? Would I be excited to be at a show? And especially if it's like a band I've never seen before, like, would would I ever get like bored? Would it, would it ever feel drony, or is it gonna keep changing and like making me feel excited and keyed in and like leaned in to the experience? Um, so I think that's just like the general way we approach it. Um, it's just like for kind of like a you know ambiguous term, but just like the energy. It is the it. energy. And that's something like, everyone should be able yeah. to feel. Whether I'm driving, running, or whatever it is, when it kicks in and like. Uh, holiday or something like that you're just like oh it just like gets you it like pumps you up but um you know we never i don't think we ever said that daniel's here because he also is a runner yeah <laughs> we just we just jumped right into the drumming and music for out. that's all right yeah this is a running podcast i guess technically i mean i still like though. to talk more <laughs> about the music I'd like talk. i want to know uh, like i find it hard not to sing along to the songs and I've watched your videos and you're not singing while you're on the drums. <laughs> and I'm like, how does, how, how do you not, like you were hearing these songs, you got it, you know, every word. And like, how are you not chiming in? Um, one reason may be that I can't sing. So if any mics pick up my voice, it's, it's, <laughs> it's bad for everyone. That's funny. We were, we were at a cover band, um, concert just the other night and I had my phone, I was recording and I happened to be singing along. I was like, Oh, I feel bad for the people that were around me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. Oh, man. And, um, but then, so you, so obviously you've been in Turnstile for how long? How long has it been now? Um, I think the band started in like 2011. Okay, so, so quite some time. Yeah. Because you're, how how old were you when you first at least started playing with Turnstile? Um, I was like 21. Okay. Then. So yeah. Yeah. And you, and you, been in a ton of bands in Baltimore. Um, mm-hmm. I know there's some other bands are still together that have like rotating members. I think like Angel Dust, and mm-hmm. then um, there's like a few other ones. I think yeah, Praise too. Uh, those are kind of like yeah, the, yeah. the three that are. Still so has this just been? So has that kind of been your constant thread? Is just playing the drums throughout and just knowing like that's your core identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I. I moved up to Baltimore uh, to attend Towson University. Oh, okay. Um, Tigers. Go Tigers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shout out, Tigers. Uh, it's been a while. Like, what were you studying? Um, sociology and cultural anthropology. Nice. Um, it's a good so thing. I'm, I'm not sure good if thing I... Good thing take <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's uh, debatable whether or not I've used my degree or it's not. All right. I don't know if any of us have in the proper way. I mean, technically, like yeah. I, I like to think that it's the seasoning on the other stuff that I do. Mm. Um, there you go. Good way to yeah, put it. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, so you're here, you're playing with Turnstile. Mm-hmm. And I feel lucky enough to just hear you guys before I feel like it's starting to snowball. Like I feel like this last year has been huge like because I was like wow these guys sound great I want to go see them you opened up for a blink 182 you did all this stuff but before that I feel like you guys were already something before that like you were going on the European tour and uh you just seem to be blowing up like do you feel it does this feel like this is something now yeah um you know kind of a combination 
culmination of a lot of things all at once. But the last couple of years have felt um, very life changing in a lot of ways. Um, but certainly with the band, uh, it, mostly in that, like there are just a lot of opportunities now. We've always um, tried to just do the the funnest thing, like the the, the freshest, the newest experience. Um, kind of opportunity that comes our way and you know playing in a hardcore band um that's not always the case that you get to play like a festival with a bunch of like indie or like electronic uh music artists or or rappers um things like that but um recently we've been able to do so much in terms of like different festivals different tours uh like the late night uh talk shows um that's cool, gotta like be podcast. insane. Like yeah. I can't imagine. Like, is it's yeah? Is it surreal to think even just a couple of years ago? And of course, like you were saying, you've played a huge metal fests or hardcore fests. So it's like you weren't unknown in that scene. But then, like you said, then playing festivals that have you know a diverse array of like all acts from but, pop to and I do feel like you guys kind of cross over. Like, yeah, like I feel like you have that appeal that isn't like niched into just hardcore like well i think it's because you do you have good hooks in your song like, yeah there's yeah. not it's obviously anyone who listens to a song and gets it and gets it stuck in their head for the whole day um i mean I think pretty that much that's in there there's at least three turnstile songs that once i hear them they're oh, in yeah. there for the rest of the day for sure holiday that's awesome Underwater boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and no, totally. And then earworms. But then having that and knowing that that's, you know, the glow on the album that, you know, your most recent album that's taking you to this next level is, does that feel completely surreal to be in that spot? It does. Yeah. It's a great <laughs> word for it. Yeah. Definitely. It's been surreal. Everything that we've like experienced since the album has come out, where it came out uh, kind of right at the end of the COVID pandemic. Yeah. And I guess we had kind of lucky timing. With that, um, our first show back, which was like um, Clifton Park, a uh, huge outdoor show in a band shell. Um, it was like the perfect. <laughs> I've driven by that so many times. I've been like, why is that just <laughs> in the middle of a field? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like- it, it's it's kind of strange looking out there. Um, and it was just like the perfect venue for like basically what felt like a big family reunion for so many friends that hadn't seen each other throughout mm. the entire like COVID pandemic. And then. For there to be a show as like the 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 focus of that event um and it for it to be on like a new album it was just a great like perfect storm um and then everything since then has been just consistently surreal <laughs> <That's> <laughs> crazy. you're also big into like helping other people learn the drums and and working with people and as far as you started off like i thought it was interesting that you mentioned in this one piece that you started off in like forums mm-hmm. to to learn the drums it wasn't like you had like a bunch of friends that used to like skateboarding you get together with other friends and you just keep trying tricks you're learning drums basically by talking to people online which i thought was fascinating but i'm also like i've i felt like music or musicianship might go the way of the dodo or something because i didn't see bands that were playing instruments you see a lot of sampling you see a lot of that mm-hmm. stuff so two things like do you feel like hardcore or even just regular musicianship is alive and kicking and that we're going to continue to see bands with drums guitars basses and all that stuff or do you feel like it is kind of like being you know chipped away at from sample machines and that kind of stuff yeah, I mean, there's definitely an argument for like instrumentalists um, kind of being phased out in a way. Uh, more recently, with uh, the rise and like accessibility of all like the music making software, um, but I don't think so because music is you know not to get all existential, but like it, it's just it's rooted in like a feeling, and it's like the most human music I think will always resonate the most um so part of that um is playing acoustic instruments mm-hmm. or just you know actually playing instruments and having the imperfections and the human elements of that so um i'm happy that like there's so much software and the means to create music in like your bedroom on like inexpensive computers like it it 
it really opens the doors to more people expressing themselves and having that heard somewhere yeah. in the world. Um, but I don't, I don't think it really uh, is competition with the acoustic. One, one thing he said that made me think of this right before you jump in the, the physical part of it. I didn't even think about that. Like um, even when you're a kid and there's a guitar riff on or something, we all pretend air guitar or whatever mm -hmm. and drums several times. I, I've never actually done anything on a drum set that would make anybody want to hear it. But you know, you, you sit there and you tap it out and stuff like that. So there is a physical aspect that I guess. Do you, I, I, I've actually been thinking about this a lot recently and you'd probably be a good person to ask. So like, what you were talking about, about people, musicians, musicianship and learning instruments and performing. So, cause you, when you started learning, it was still pre cell phone, right? Like 2000s, mid 2000s. Uh, yeah. I, I had like a razor. So that was <laughs> okay. like, but, yeah. but that was pre smartphone. I, wait, sure. he lived in PG County. He had a razor. <laughs> he, had, he had a razor. By the way, if you're listening, you don't know where PG County is. It's a nice County. It's a nice area of uh, Maryland. Yeah. Um, so nice. I meant like between, uh, uh, with smartphone, you know, smartphones. Yeah, yeah. because I feel like with, e even with myself, it's so easy when you're bored to go to your phone and just start scrolling through things where oh, yeah. I, f I wonder if now that everyone, in including myself, are addicted to phones, if that time which would have been spent learning a new skill or something interesting mm. is now just being like, oh, I'm bored, I'll just do this. And I wonder if that's going to affect things like art or musicianship or actual like physical talents because right now you say the flip side though is that you do like he was talking about the, all the software like if a kid wants to if they have music in them and they want to go to what's the uh, band oh uh, just like Apple. garage band or whatever yeah. Or, mm -hmm. yeah you can go and you can play around with music and i think about like you robbie's a writer and i think you would write no matter what when we go someplace on the plane you pull out your notebook and you yeah scribble your notes i don't think it would necessarily replace that. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's the same thing as saying video games or TV in the 90s or yeah, 2000s. That's so why like, I got rid of my Sony <laughs> PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I do think about that, though, if it's such, um, I don't know. I think it'll, you're right. It'll probably, yeah. I don't know. Can I, can, I go, <laughs> can I go back to the forums? Because I feel like that's mm -hmm. part of the tie-in to running. So the same thing happened when I started running. I started going online, and at the time there was a, a app called Daily Mile, which ended up losing out to Strava. And Strava became the place to to track your miles. I don't know if you use Strava. Do you use Strava? Mm -hmm. All right, you can. It, it, you, now that people can DM. <laughs> oh <my> gosh, <laughs> block um, it, make it stop, yeah, make it stop. <laughs> uh, anyway, the that was a place to kind of learn about running for me and figure out where I fit into the space. You said that you uh, started going onto forums for drumming stuff, and then you said even now. When people reach out to you, you'll help them like what kit they should get, what, you know, what, how they should set up. Obviously you're sponsored, um, uh, by the cymbal company. Uh, yeah. Southern. Zildjian cymbals, yeah. Lowood yeah. drums. Yeah. And stuff like that. So you're helping the kids who are listening to you now kind of figure stuff out. Can you kind of tell me about like how you built community around that and how you keep it now that you are kind of like in a huge spotlight, you probably are getting like a lot of questions. And a lot of people reaching out and you can't respond to everybody. But how, how do you feel that uh, you're able to interact in the community online? Um, just, yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate that like anyone has interest in asking me any questions um, because I, I love to answer them. And yeah, like you said, can't answer everything. We're like up until like a year ago, I did answer every single oh, DM geez. I got. And That's like amazing. I just wanted to, you know, if it just took 30 seconds of my time um, and that meant something to someone, I, I thought that was, you know, it, isn't it sometimes redundant though? Like, is it like, like one of the reasons we started the website was here's the, you have a question, here's, you want to know what shoe to get? Here's our top picks. Here's our hmm. thing. Because otherwise we get people saying, oh, I've got, I've run like this. What shoe should I get? Yeah. 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 Which I think we still try to address. I still, Yeah. It is difficult though because at the like we're a pretty small company. I mean, it's a similar situation. We're four people, and it's when we get a lot of questions about the same thing, shoes and gear and things like that. Um, I mean, I do try to respond to as many as I can, but we're, we're five, especially five on Instagram. But it's it is <laughs> it is hard to do. Like yeah. it's a it's a 
it's a lot. It's like an extra job, but it is cool being able to help people and see like for the same reasons with running, um, you know, people who are just getting started or kind of fig- figuring out what to do. Have yeah. you started interacting like online for running to like figure stuff out or are you actually, no, I thought about like finding like the right Reddit to post on and like asking questions. Cause I do have like some technical questions, which I would like to ask someone. And I was like thinking about like, maybe I should just like find a coach. <laughs> Let's or go. We're here. Fire them yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I haven't, I've, I've just, I've consumed a lot of podcasts, um, a lot of YouTube, a lot of books and audiobooks. Nice. Um, so when did you actually start running then? Um, well, like throughout my whole life, I've, I've liked being physical. I think I'm one of those people that just gets antsy if I don't exert myself physically. Yep. Um, so I kind of like just would run around the block at my mom's house when I was excited about a drum idea, I'd, like run out the house and do a lap, which is probably like, I don't know, like half a mile or something. Um, I don't know if that counts as running. I, I wouldn't say I really started running until mm, like five months ago. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you no just did the Baltimore half marathon mm-hmm. in October. So what was that the start at like, I'm going to run and might as well sign up for something to train for. Yeah. Um, I was really inspired to run and then um, enter a race uh, on the, that Blink-182 tour um, that we did recently at the end of the summer. Um, and uh, I was inspired by Alex, who is our photographer and videographer. Um, he's a runner. Dang, we should get then, Alex on too. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he would. I'm sure he would love it. Yeah, and he's yeah. a great guy. Um, I was also inspired by uh, Travis Barker, the drummer for Blink-182. Um, he's a runner and someone who runs for I like... I didn't know Travis was. Yeah. Yeah, he's actually... I think he's done some marathons before. Mm. Like, pretty decent time, yeah. Yeah, he's doing a half marathon for New Year's Eve um, coming up. And um, he's someone who runs for, like, reasons that I can relate to, where it's a really just, like, solo, like, get in your head and have like a meditative experience or have just like a, I need to get out there and do th- something physically because otherwise like, um, you know, life just like eats away <laughs> if you don't get that in there. I got to ask way. you cause like your job is, is music. Mm-hmm. So when you run music or no music. So actually recently no music because I've been doing like, I've been keeping an eye on my heart rate and my heart rate will jump uh, up a lot. Yeah. Um, but for the, the Baltimore, uh, half marathon, I had music the whole time. Okay. Like when it comes to like, all right, like an all out effort, uh-huh. I, I was really excited to be able to listen to music. I'm like, all right, now's my time. <laughs> I right. really enjoy it. What's your playlist then for, for the Baltimore half? Who was on that? Oh, you don't have to name everybody. You did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Taylor Swift. Oh. <laughs> no, not Taylor Swift. I like Taylor Swift, but, yeah. uh, a lot of turnover. Um, Dude, I love turnover. Really? Which is funny because I always, whenever I'm typing in turnover or turnstile, I'm always <laughs> yeah. typing in the wrong name, like to my Spotify <laughs> search. I'm like, but they're a Richmond based band or used to be in Richmond at least. Um, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. they moved to California. But um, I lo- oh, yeah, they're great. Anyways. Yeah, continue, they're continue. wonderful. <laughs> like starting that, that half marathon, it was like cold and rainy. Uh, um, the first like 20 minutes of my playlist was all turnover because uh, it's really like chill, relaxed, yeah. vibey, yeah. uh, kind of like ethereal yeah. music and put on like the, uh, the AirPod, um, like the underwater setting of it where it kind of drowns everything out uh, yeah. and to be in that huge crowd of people with so much energy and chaos and in a good way for that to just like disappear and feel like I'm just there by myself yeah. Um, while still being in like a big community sure. of, of runners was a really cool feeling. And I like will never forget that first second of the race where yeah. like I turned on the music and started my watch and um, everything just kind of like shifted in oh, my brain. Cool. And it felt amazing. Now it's interesting because you picked uh, not the easiest course to start running on. 
Like that Baltimore half is a challenging course. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. I see? didn't know. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, it's like let's one give of the you hardest. a fun one. <laughs> oh, interesting. It's like one of the hardest. Like, really? Okay. Courses. Yeah. Because you know when you run up, basically you're running uphill the whole way from Patterson Park to uh, Lake Montebello. You get, yeah. to, you get yeah. to see the the shell that you're talking about in Clifton mm -hmm. Park. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. you run, you know, and then it's just more hills and it's just hills the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. So that's good. That's good though that you uh, didn't even felt, know it. Yeah. And it was, awesome. we ran almost the exact same time. And I was, oh, really? I had to go back and look at the, um, I was like, did I run beside you? Because it was literally like 10 seconds off. Oh, wow. But I think you started a little bit further back. So I was closer to the front with some people, but. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I, I had funny. no idea. Yeah. I wish Wait, you didn't know it. Robbie was running? <laughs> oh, I, I did recently. But yeah, dude, I would have I would have found that's you if we knew good. each other. That would have been really cool. I didn't know a single person there. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I right. did know someone somewhere I'm in sure the crowd. A lot of people knew you, yeah. 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 That would be cool. Next next uh race yeah. to know someone there. Definitely. Yeah, it's uh, when you're talking about music, I used to when I first started running, I listened to music pretty much all the time and then I, I think for the first year, and then I stopped um, after that. But there's, there were, there are some. I know what you're talking about. I think it was my second half marathon, and it was, it was rainy, and there was this part like around mile ten where it was just the rain was coming down, and I remember it was like Radiohead let down mm -hmm. playing, and it was just like that's a really like vibey song, anyways. <laughs> so like to come with the rain, and you're feeling like tired but also excited. I don't know. That's like my favorite music race memory, I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That's great. That was a good one. That. But so, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's it's interesting because I feel like I, I don't listen to music anymore because I feel like that it, you do get that time where it's just nothing. I feel like yeah, it's I don't, running. I don't I don't, know. I'm not so strict about it. Yeah. It's just how I feel. Like, mm -hmm. one day I'll be like, ah, I don't feel like messing with the earphones and I'll just go yeah. out and sometimes i'm like i'd like to listen to music sometimes i'll listen to like an audiobook or podcast it just depends but as long as you don't have a boom box on the trails that's <laughs> that's the only a, a boom box anywhere <laughs> or like uh like a, a speaker clip on speaker on the trails i feel yeah. like that's my one thing i can never do <laughs> that, that's good yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, good for the community yeah so, so you started running like did you just go to a store and say give me a shoe Kind of, yeah, kind of a new move, not, or I mean, not a new move. I don't know. It's Maybe just a move. Right thing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm trying to think. What did I run in when I? Because I started to like train. I guess like on the last week of the Blink tour. Because I was like mm -hmm. class classically inspired by David Goggins, or like <laughs> Travis, and then two of the uh, security guards on that tour. Uh, Pepe and Damien, they were really hyped on like Stay hard. David. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas like it got me really hyped and like in the gym on that tour and then to run. Cause I never even thought of distance running as like a really like intense and ferocious thing. I, I don't know why. I just thought like, oh, that's like a relaxed activity. I just didn't even consider what pace was and that you could push yourself to 110% with yeah. distance running. Uh, but then after um, listening, to the David Goggins audiobook, like for both of his books. See, I was perfect like, to run with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I, I listen to both of those during runs and uh, I, I enjoy them both. Like you don't have to, you can, I think that people get upset with David Goggins because it's like so hardcore. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you don't have to sleep on your floor and, <laughs> you know, do carry, every run with your boats. shirt off. Yeah, yeah. but... You, what you can take from it is that, yeah, you can give a little bit more. You can work a little harder. You can not take the excuse to go mm -hmm. sit down when, you know, you need to get a run, a training run in or something like that. Like, stay hard. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I relate to David Goggins in a lot of ways. I don't know if, like, all the stuff in his books resonate with me. But I really enjoyed how emotional he made it and how much of, like, running was something necessary uh, for him to, like, to vent to like to use as kind of like a therapy to use as a reflection of like where he is in life like he's always kind of um like explaining how his identity is shifting um in line with how his body is changing and how his mind is changing 
and that it just connects to running so much. So I, I like that like overall approach for running, just being like a conduit for being this kind of person and to having this kind of like discipline and drive. Uh, so I really resonated with that bit of it. Um, but yeah, I'm like the opposite where I'm like, all right, I'm only doing like zone two, <laughs> trying to like relax as much as possible uh, right now, like in, in training and just trying to like enjoy running and trying to balance it with the other things in life, especially the other like physically demanding things where like I'm trying to recover from everything I'm doing. Um, but yeah, in like one of the David Goggins books, he was like, you should sign up for a race right now. I was like, all right, I pulled out my phone and I searched Baltimore marathon and I found it. I was like, this is exactly three months out. Whoa. This perfect. seems perfect. Yeah. So I signed up like at like 5 AM on the bus <laughs> after finishing that chapter. I was like, okay. Did Here you tell is. people like, Hey, I've, I just signed up for a race. Yeah. I told a couple of friends, told my girlfriend, um, was, uh, was anybody like you're crazy or people were like, ah, oh, cool. No, they're like, yeah, that's nice. cool. That seems like something that so, you do. So did you run with Travis on tour or, um, or, no. what did, or how did you train? How did you run on tour? Um, I ran a couple times with, um, Alex, uh, who's okay. with our crew. Um, I remember doing a, a 5k in like Austin or da somewhere in Texas where it was like a hundred degrees oh, humid. It was, <laughs> and you weren't like, I'm done with running. <laughs> well that, no, that, cause that was, that was like the start. I was like, all right, I haven't run in any way in a long time. I got to get like the acclimation run in where my calves are going to be extremely sore for a couple of weeks. <laughs> And I did that and my calves were like debilitatingly sore for a couple of weeks, but that was like, man, okay. Yeah. If this doesn't want to make me quit, then it should all be downhill. For I mean, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you should after Baltimore, let me ask you a question though, because we get to travel around for running a lot. So we see a lot of different cities. I'm guessing on tour, you get to see a lot of cities. I love Baltimore. I think Baltimore gets the shittiest rap. We are a gem. We're right on between Philly and DC. We're easy to get to New York. You get on a train, you're at, hour and a half away from New York where it's, it's a gem. The people are actually the best. Yeah. Like there's there, just a good time. There are some parts of it that are troubled. And obviously yeah. the, the government here isn't <laughs> perfect, but like when you go travel, like even like place like Austin where people are flocking to, I go there and I'm like, it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's, I, and I love Baltimore. Like you give me a day in Baltimore where the Orioles are playing or you go to the Ravens game in the early fall when it's still warm out, something like that. You can't tell me there's a better city on the planet. <laughs> you may not go to the same <laughs> level as I'm going here, but like tell the people like this isn't so bad. Yeah. I mean, Baltimore is great. I've been living here for a while. I've been visiting here for a long time. Like when I was 15 years old, uh, traveling for shows and yeah, Baltimore doesn't have like as transient, of a population and a community compared to a lot of these other bigger cities where people come for work or, you know, for whatever reason, um, the, people have roots in Baltimore and it's a small enough city where if, yeah, there's like an O's game or, or, or whatever, um, you, you feel the community wherever you are. And I'm not even a sports person, but I just enjoy I, the yeah, solidarity. I, I, I can't name, this guy could name all the Orioles. I, I can't name, <laughs> I could, he could probably I tell me a name and I would tell you if they play for the Orioles, <laughs> but like even, okay. So Canton Waterfront Park, the WTMD concerts, did you guys ever play one of those? No, actually. Uh, um, that would have been yeah. awesome. Cause that's right near our house. You think really? about, yeah, <laughs> yeah come slum down. <laughs> I think the moment has passed. I know. Damn it. Um, <laughs> yeah, but no, Baltimore is such a good place. And I feel like, especially for the a scene like a hardcore scene where it is about community people coming out and getting together i feel like baltimore does embrace a lot of that even with our running groups there's a several running groups in baltimore now that really flourished and i feel like we our running group faster bastards um i guess tangential to believe in the run but you I, started it yes yeah, I, I started the and it's become a, it, it's it exists parallel. I try to keep it separate because I don't believe in the runs clearly a business. And these are friends that I started running with and I, I never want them to feel like mm -hmm. it, it's a, 
a venture. It's just people mm-hmm. we like running with. Mm-hmm. You would probably enjoy running with Faster Bass. Oh, I'm on. down. Yeah. yeah. Right. But it's like a, it's a crew of people who I felt, uh, I mean, the reason I gravitated in the beginning was because it didn't feel like runners, but we're runners. Like yeah. it was just, and super welcoming. And at this point, everyone's best friends in life. I mean, it's a weird thing. So when we started, you know, it was just people coming together and it was, we, we weren't the runners. We weren't wearing neon clothing. We weren't like, matter of fact, John Ober, who's a huge fan of yours, <laughs> was coming in, cut up, you know, rock shirts, you know, it was like mm-hmm. cotton just chopped up, you know, some of you, some people still smoke cigs when they yeah. <laughs> first started. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we tattoos, all that stuff. So it, we kind of just gravitated towards each other and then it became kind of like a, a community, but it is weird because we've had people who met in the group now have babies who are, are engaged or married that met through the group, it, and it really has. And then the Believe Run Club, which meets here on Thursdays, they're like a, a younger group mm-hmm. now. So they're, I mean, I'd say the average age there is like 20 early something. 20s, yeah. Oh, yeah, mid wow. 20s. And they have a whole different vibe, but we all come together when there's like race and stuff. It's both groups will, yeah, come together and it's pretty cool. Yeah, and I feel like that's, uh, I mean, like, I, yeah, exactly. Like I was saying with the hardcore community, I feel like it's just such a great spot to build that art, your art and work on it and have great shows. Uh, do you feel like that's been huge with your growth as a drummer and with the growth of Turnstile over the years? Yeah, yeah. Um, the community is such a big part of the culture for like hardcore punk. Um, kind of think of it. In a similar way, um, how I approach running or anything else I do, where I like to do like solo things, whether that's like drumming by myself, in my mom's basement when I was younger, or running, um, or doing, or just listening to music. It's like a very intimate experience. It's something you like really get like deep inside yourself. Um, you can be introspective with, um, and when you can bring that to a table with other people, like at a race or run club, or you go to like a hardcore show, um, then there's a sense of like, I'm enjoying something and maybe like collaborating, uh, with other people, um, over this thing that like is so intimate to me and wow, it's actually intimate to you and you and Mm -hmm. you and you, and we've all like come to this same conclusion that we love whatever thing this is, uh, together. And to be able to, to like share that with people like that, that is what community is, right? It's yeah. not like you just get together. People are like, all right, let's, let's find out what we all like. What, what do we all have well, in common, It is. You know? It's the, it, it's the gravity of it. It's like it pulled, like the people who are interested naturally bond to each other. But it's interesting to me because hardcore is such a niche as mm-hmm. far as, as music goes. I'm sure your mom loved hearing <laughs> you practice hardcore drums in her yeah. basement all the time, but like, were you always into hardcore punk or did you experiment with other genres? Like, like how did, how'd you end up? Um, yeah, I, I kind of started out just listening to punk when I was really young. I had a brother who's, um, almost four years older than me. And, um, he showed me a lot of hardcore punk music, uh, where it was kind of like the first thing I listened to. We didn't have like a terribly musical household where I would hear stuff on the radio and my mom would listen to like some Motown and like Aretha Franklin, but otherwise, um, we weren't like jamming vinyl in the house and going to concerts as a family. Um, but it was my brother who showed me like minor threat and stuff like that when I was, I think like seven years old, like really. Is that the first band you fell in love with? Like the first one that you're like, this is it. Um, actually, no, to be truthful, like I, I think Blink-182 and oh, Raging so Machine, like those two were probably the, the very first. To, and you get to play with them. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. That, huge full circle moment. That's sure. crazy. That is so nuts. Yeah. Um, Rage Against the Machine was good. Like, like that's one of those albums that exists in a time for me. Like, it's mm-hmm. like, it is that time. Like, I can't listen to that music without going, being transported back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. so weird. And they just stopped, I guess. Right. Well, there's, I mean, they still have all their individual stuff and things like that, but I think they are going, are they going on tour again? Yeah. They've played a few shows. Yeah, okay. Uh, but, but I respect, you know, yeah, I, I think they have like some ideological purposes for not playing. Right. Probably a whole lot of reasons, but I mean, it's kind of cool that 
they did what they did in this really intense fireball of intensity and mm. then yeah. stopped um, because yeah, like they were, it was such a time and place to like be alive when rage was playing and putting out new music and yeah, it was, it was no mystery why they were so big. They, it was just, it feels so much the energy that you talk, talk about. I mean, now that you're yeah. talking about it, I do think there's some, a little bit of similarities in, in some ways, like the, even the cowbells on <laughs> on parade, like, mm. you, cause you utilize cowbells a lot in, mm -hmm. in some of your songs as well. Now when, when we talk about cowbells, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not the Will Ferrell. No, not that guy. Yeah. yeah. But it is interesting because I'm thinking of that part in, uh, is it bull, it's on Bulls, Bulls on Parade, right? Yeah. yeah. And it reminds me of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something. Yeah. Cowbells, very cool. Have their place in, <laughs> in rock music, in aggressive music. Well, it's sure. neat when you don't notice it. Like, I didn't notice it. Uh, I was wa Again, I was watching that video of you playing the drums on stage, and I noticed you hit them. And, like, I don't hear it when I'm listening to the music and go, oh, that's Cowbell. Mm -hmm. You know, I just hear that, that tink, tink, tink kind of yeah. thing, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty rad. So, I mean, you gotta be somewhat endurance athlete to do what you do. Like looking at that, we talked a little bit before we actually got in here because, uh, salt loss and sweat and all that stuff. How long is a typical show? Um, nowadays it's about an hour, like back in the day and with most of the bands I've played in like 20 25 minute set, just like high intensity, just blazing through it. Uh, but nowadays we're playing like headline shows or festival slots that like require a longer set. And we still always play like shorter than um, we're usually asked to, but it, it end, ends up being about an hour of and, intense. Like that's physical. Like it is. Yeah. Cause it's your whole body. Like, it, like people think of the drums, they think of your arms, but I mean, people who know, I guess they would know. But when I thought of it, I was there. And then I see you using the kick drum and going off of that. And I'm like, his entire being is is in motion for, I guess, five minutes at a time in spurts. And then you get a little break and then it's back in. Yeah. And they're, they're little breaks. I, I do like transition stuff on this like uh, computer pad thing that I have. And then I've been doing drum solos uh, more recently. Uh, which is cool because I'm like really excited to give everyone else in the band like a little bit of break um, and the audience. And it's kind of like a, a, a palette refresher. And then when you come back in a, uh, the next song, it's really big change in dynamic and it's exciting. But that's another part of like managing and like pacing uh, energy and like just intensity with output. Um, so it, it it is physical. I, I feel like it's kind of like an athletic have you gotten into speed work yet? Um, not like very formally. I, I like started doing um, like eight hundred or no four hundred meter repeats at like the the last like three weeks of that three month uh, oh, training right. before the half marathon, which is like you know maybe a little bit haphazard. Uh, <laughs> but I was like trying to squeeze a lot of stuff in where I was like, okay, I'm just doing only zone two, uh, like Maffetone, uh training before then and then once i got closer to the race i was like oh no i don't even know what my <laughs> pace goal is i have no idea yeah, how yeah. fast i i, I mean on your run. first one a lot of people go in it's just like survive right yeah, yeah. your pace is pretty fast for your first one yeah, i'll say was. that especially on that course <laughs> yeah it's actually ridiculous. that's cool to know i i, I wasn't sure yeah you're, you're a stud oh thank you no it's like for legitimately great on that course yeah <laughs> It, it felt good. Actually, the downhills on that course were really interesting because, like, I feel better mechanically running uphill because it just makes more sense to me, like, being on the balls of your feet and just feels like a human running uh -huh. to me. <laughs> downhill, I'm like, what I do like I a human do? Running. <laughs> like, yeah, I like, picture the, the, like, anatomy, like, uh, but... Like, like the pedestrian sign of running. Exactly. That's what I feel like. What's cra okay, so, I mean, the endurance, I would think, between, like, doing a heavy drum set that for that short spurt, like, boom, I got to hit it. Mm -hmm. And then some, that to me would be like equivalent to like speed work. Like you're going to go out, you're going to mm -hmm. try to put that effort in. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you get, you get a chance to recover. You do like a minute or two of like down and then you're back up. Except and, it's like maybe like speed work with a hit workout thrown in. I know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's insane. But yeah, it's jamming. You know what I'm also curious about though? Like Robbie, you read that book, uh, the Motley Crue book, Dirt mm -hmm. or whatever. The Dirt. And you guys are hardcore. 
But I don't see you guys shooting heroin, crashing <laughs> their cars. You haven't seen. I haven't yet. seen. Wait for you, it. You, you mentioned a girlfriend, not like a bunch of. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, womanizing or anything like that is the scene different than it obviously than it was, uh, you know, back in those days. But like, is it just, it's not interesting. It's been done, whatever, like what, like, or are there just, there's bands that you come across that still are in that mode? Like what's going on in the, in the scene behind the scenes? Well, I'm sure that happens in a lot of places. Uh, it doesn't with turnstile. Um, but I don't know if there is like a scene because there's rock and there's punk and there's rap and there's indie and there's so much that's popular nowadays where like bands or artists could be touring with each other and like, okay, this is like what the backstage of like this tour looks like or their festivals when there are like, you know, such a diverse lineup of people playing and it's just, there's so much going on. So I think that means there's less of like uh, an aesthetic or a lifestyle to subscribe to or to aspire to uh, for people in that position. So there's less of like a, all these like, you know, glam Over the metal top. or like rock bands, like all doing this one thing and the fans kind of like romanticize and look and look forward to like seeing that in person. It, it's, it's, it's so like varied nowadays where like, and especially in hardcore punk, there's like straight edge and there's yeah. like vegetarianism and veganism, <laughs> like very anti those norms. Yeah. Um, is there anything yeah. that you've seen that you've been like, holy crap, that <laughs> that's blowing my mind that people are doing that. Yeah. A, a little bit. And that, you know, um, I'm sure like my parents at some age, uh, in my life thought that was like inevitable if I was touring, playing drums full time, but, but they understood what straight edge was and um, that I was very comfortable with myself. So I don't think they were ever too worried, but. So uh, are you, are you straight edge or have you always been? Yeah. I, oh, okay. I am. And like, you know, I'm, I less like fervently identify with that now, but the more years that go by and the more like grow as a person and age, uh, the more I'm like fortunate to have really strongly identified like that when I was younger, yeah, because man. especially in like high school, when you just are finding out who you are and how to fit in with people around you, it's easy to just do things because other people are doing things. So like, namely if it's like going to parties and like Fitting drinking in. a lot and yeah, you just want to fit in no matter what it takes. Um, so I like the essence of straight edge being like, okay, yeah, it explicitly says you shouldn't drink or do drugs, but I like the essence of you kind of rebel against your peers um, by not doing those normative things at, at that younger age or that like rock bands were doing at that time um, when straight edge uh, came about um, for the sake of making your own independent choices. I, I think that's at the core of the idea of straight edge. That's it, a very mature thing to hit. When yeah, you're like, like, how do you like decide kid, that? Like, I mean, that's what I, I feel like e when I was that age, when, mm, yeah, because when I was playing music, it was in the early 2000s or mid 2000s. And that was kind of when straight edge was catching on pretty, was pretty big at that time within certain scenes, a lot of bands we play with. And I was like, in some ways, I felt like we sometimes, sometimes made fun of them, not to their face, but behind the back. Being like, being like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How could, like, seriously is like, are you like, it seemed like they were just doing it to be different, but not for like a real moral purpose. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that happens Philosophical. too. Yeah. And, and, uh, well, some people just uh, as you would want to belong. Exactly. Do drink or, right. or drink. There's some people probably just want to join up and be part of something. But, na but yeah. now looking back, I'm like, I wish, I would have taken on some of that, some of those aspects in some ways, because I feel like there was a lot of time and that was wasted just trying to be, well, trying to fit in with that. Yeah, but if you'd done know. that, you'd probably be on your phone <laughs> and not. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. But um, yeah, that's pretty. So you basically been straight edge since high school then? Yeah, okay. I, I've i like never had a drink or smoked um anything and no regret there yeah. not doing those things but um what about I mean, the rest of the band dude that's why you can run on 137 yeah. <laughs> first half <marathon>. healthy, easy, <laughs> easy, easy, healthy. <laughs> uh, yeah i looking back i'm like okay that's good i uh i'm glad i didn't like just smoke or drink 
just to do it. Like mm-hmm. if I ever really wanted to, I think I, I, I'd be cool with that. But yeah, I'm happy to not have done those things. And it's not just, like you look like you're judging other people if they decide to do this. Yeah, things, absolutely not. Although that is a thing. Well, like yeah. you said, people are just mm-hmm. as like tribalistic and clicky with straight edge or anything else in life. That's just like a human thing. But um, yeah, I'm now that I'm older, I'm I'm like kind of thankful for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's def- definitely. Uh, so uh, thinking on the, are you vegetarian or vegan? Vegetarian. Okay. So how does that play into your nutrition for, for running or for even refueling after drumming or getting your protein in? What do you, how do you work with that? Um, I mean, historically it's been like slightly just less convenient than being an omnivore. <laughs> but That's the problem. Yeah. 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 Like you're, t- you're touring and stuff, you know? Yeah. Although it's gotten a lot better yeah. like every year. There's more and more options. It's more like uh, popular, more marketable. Uh, yeah. So it's not too hard anymore. Um, I've always been pretty aware of like macronutrients um, because I used to lift a lot. Like I trained powerlifting many, many years ago. Um, that's kind of that's kind of like what got me into being physical um, other than just drumming. Um, but yeah, like I, I try to eat some more whole foods as opposed to process. I try to keep an eye on macros, but you know, life gets in the way with <laughs> touring. It can, it can be kind of hard. I do make a smoothie every day. Like when I go on tour, I bring my Vitamix yeah. blender and like, if everything else in my day is like chaos nutritionally, at least I have my mm-hmm. smoothie there. Um, and I actually have some digestive issues, which I don't really want to talk about too much. But like, <laughs> you need uh, to be a runner for like one yeah, more year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Next year you'll be like, yeah, it's, it's like Robbie will tell you all about. <laughs> it's a weekly topic. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, actually, that's that's one of the many reasons I've like got into running and have got more and more excited about it because I listen to podcasts and read books and listen to audiobooks. I um I hear about like training your gut and training and um these energy systems and like adaptations and i'm like oh these are kind of some um hurdles i've tried to overcome and have struggled with uh with drumming and getting Uh older and my gut being like more like volatile um and nutrition just being harder to keep up with recover being harder to keep up with um i didn't know there's so much of a focus in running and oh yeah so much of um just this like especially for longer distances or like marathon plus um, is like honing in on your nutrition and like practicing like the logistics of like having a gel or whatever and practicing with those, not just like getting to the race mm-hmm. and no, trying these how, things. That's for the how first you time. get a blowout. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I never related. I could never relate to people on tour because you know, they, they'd eat a huge meal a couple, a couple hours before they got on stage and they'd be fine. Where I have to fast like six hours before oh, that's I play, or have like a, a, a light drink or something, but uh-huh. not eat a, a meal like six hours before wow. I play. See, that's me running. Like I, that's why I don't like nighttime running that much, because I know when I wake up I can just have, and I don't have GI issues really, but like when I wake up, have a graham cracker, go for my run, mm-hmm. drink some water, have some coffee, go for my run, and I'm fine. When I try to do it in the afternoon, like when we went, we went to one of the the ones in Druid Hill Park, mm-hmm. I'm miserable Like, I, if I have something in my stomach. It's interesting because I'm kind of the opposite in that way. That's it's so like, <laughs> Yeah. Like Dude. nighttime running, no, no issues. Morning or night? Oh, yeah. Um, I want to say morning, but I, I wake up really late, so it's technically <laughs> afternoon. Uh, but, yeah, when I wake up uh, fasted or just like, um, like an electrolyte tablet, maybe it's like some BCAs or something uh, very light. Um, but, yeah. Ideally, when I wake up, for sure. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, I feel like... I feel like... You know how you said your smoothie? Just, if you have that, you feel like your day is good. Mm-hmm. For me, if I get my run done, everything else is just gravy. Yeah, yeah. I feel that. Yeah, I feel like I'm... I want to be a morning person so badly. And, and there have been some marathon cycles where I've done it successfully. Yeah, the, all the races are in the morning, so you've got to practice. But it's just... Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It's just I feel way more alive when I run at night and it's, I like way more alive. I don't know. <laughs> That's cool. I don't have to worry about 
I like the vibe of the city more too at night. Oh, really? Yeah. See, I love it's quiet. Okay, in the morning, it's so quiet. The only people out there are hardcore. Like it's like yeah, mm-hmm. it's very peaceful. And then I find in the evening I, I have to dodge people and yeah. Well, oh, I meant just like at eight o'clock at night, where it's oh, still yeah. it's similar. <laughs> Dude, you're so weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I I feel that like yeah. the less people and the more like tranquil of an environment you, you can get um the better yeah. so that, that's interesting to me because it, it doesn't sound like you run with groups that often As a matter of fact it, seems, it sounds like the race was probably one of the first times you're running with multiple people um it usually is something i find i think that sometimes in the beginning people are figuring out how they feel about running and and how it exists in their life and then you get to a certain point where you're like you know what it is fun to run with other people. And I think that's why like groups like the fast ambassadors or whatever, you start going to those things because it's that extra bit of motivation to get out. But it's also the weirdest thing when you're not looking at someone in their eyes and you're running alongside them, you find that you can talk like about, like you could have, you could go out and there's somebody that I wouldn't necessarily go out and have beers with or get dinner with, but I can have a meaningful conversation on the run and leave it Mm -hmm. out there on the pavement whatever they tell me, whatever I tell them, it's kind of like, yeah. Yeah. There's this, uh, I actually saw him recently, but when I first started running a guy who I would do all my long runs with for marathon training and we would have, you know, three hour conversations, literally never hung out with him outside of running, but just would go on, we'd run together for long runs and have like three hour talks. It's It's like when I skipped out on going to your concert, (laughs) it's like, I, I like the idea of having like going out and getting beers or, or getting dinner or whatever with um, people. But it, I really just, I like that the social to be in yeah. that kind of way. I don't know. Kind of like talking yeah. to your, talking to a therapist, mm-hmm. just laying, instead of laying on a couch, you're just looking straight ahead, talking to the person beside you. I feel that. And I, <laughs> I've always liked like pacing around and moving when I'm like thinking like a creative idea or like I'm on the phone with someone, I, I get kind of antsy if I'm just like sitting there and then my thoughts feel kind of like stagnated if mm-hmm. I'm just sitting in a chair being still. Mm-hmm. Um, so movement has always like helped me think, helped me breathe. Uh, and I just feel better when I'm moving. Um, I gotta say, it sounds like you probably had ADHD when you were growing up. And maybe. did your parent, <laughs> your parents never tried to get you on, <laughs> on drugs or anything it's amazing because like i, I, I feel know. like now if a kid has any extra energy like, <laughs> get that out of them oh yeah 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 that that's such a, a thing um i don't know i was never diagnosed i was the second child and if my brother has or does not have adhd i'm not sure of but like i think uh my parents were a lot more relaxed with me but um it's usually they, the teachers <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Wait, now I'm curious. Yeah, in I, class, I and do you feel like in class you could pay attention and stuff, or were you always like, uh, I just want to like, yeah. I was the worst student up until I joined yeah. band in, in high school. No way, really? Because then I was like, okay, now I can like move around and because I was a percussionist, I can just yeah, like roam you, around in the back of the classroom. <laughs> totally, they would have slapped a label on you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's all. That's that's cool though. Um, it is so, funny because so, I was. The art was where my gateway was into concentration. Mm-hmm. It, like you had band, mine was like a painting and drawing and all that kind of stuff. So it's interesting that they want to teach children a, in a certain formula that doesn't work for everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think some, it's just some kids aren't designed to sit in a Mm-mm. desk for <laughs> seven hours a day or whatever. And I think, and a lot of times I feel like that is a lot of, creative types that you know just have that energy that you need to get get it out with it whether that's an idea or just actual energy well i like what you said like about it like moving helps yeah. your thoughts right, process right. and i do feel like getting the blood flowing in a run and again another reason i like running in the morning i feel like the it clears out your head mm-hmm. yeah yeah um so did, did, when you started playing drum that's when you started playing in high school or middle school yeah like the second year of middle school and then uh, I was like just messing around with the drum set that my mom got me. And then in high school, I think is when it really began because I joined the high school band um, and had to do like a whole like audition for it. Because usually people are just like 
um, go from like elementary, elementary school band to middle school band to high school band. Mm-hmm. I found out that it's pretty rare for someone to just like audition and learn how to read music oh, wow. and all the requisite um, skills. Yeah. Right before learning how school. to read music. <laughs> it's not, well, with percussion, it's pretty easy. Like for the most part, I'd still it's not very impressive. Be able to get it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it. It's chill. You can watch a YouTube video and, and learn in, a, in an instant. But, um, but yeah, so it pretty much began in high school, um, where I was like going to class in high school and doing like the, uh, concert band, like the more formal side of things. And then going home and playing like misfits covers on, a drum set in my mom's basement. Thank you, mom, for putting up with that for so long. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it was nice to have that that like duality um, and having really encouraging uh, teachers. Like the band director was always encouraging me to try out for like all state band and all of these like extra um, I don't know all the ex- extra yeah. resources that I don't even know about because I never even. I never even looked into them. I was so not interested. I was like, I want to do this <laughs> in school, but like everything outside of that, I want to pour into like the music that I really like. Did you start making set. friends that like, did you start trying to make bands and stuff? Um, I only had like a couple friends from high school and that who I knew from middle school that were into like remotely the same kind of music. It just wasn't very popular where I was going to school in PG. Um, so kind of, but there wasn't like a scene. It was like a mm-hmm. really just a few people that I know of that like, like, okay, I like punk and you like metal. That's like kind of the same yeah. thing. You like thrash. Okay. We can kind of get together or, and do something. Or get out. So then how are you yeah. getting that? How are you feeding that or that urge or that, you know, drive to be that kind of drummer during that time? Well, I've always loved doing things by myself and just okay. getting really deep into something um, on my own time and like getting in this kind of like flow state, flow state and this like finding the concentration um, by myself. So like I was very happy with just playing oh, wow. to music in my mom's basement or to not music. I was just like hit stuff as hard as I could. And it sounded so chaotic. I'm sure. I'm sorry, <laughs> mom. <laughs> you know, um, we didn't, we know we didn't bring up his connection to running in another way, which is what through satisfy. Oh yeah, Ooh, yeah, yeah. Did the satisfy running? I feel like they worked with Turnstile and because they did. They did for, a, They did a yeah, like they a used promo. a Turnstile for one of their yeah, promotions. Yeah, for that one where they're running down the hills. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. They used Mystery. Yeah, that, I think that was pretty rad. Which is a good, great song. <laughs> do they? Do you have any of their gear? I do. I have oh, a nice. lot. They right, actually cool. they sent some. Uh, we met. I met Bryce. Last week, yeah, we saw the founder. Really? Yeah, last yeah. week actually, he was in Baltimore, uh, in Austin. Austin. Yeah, oh, oh okay. At the gotcha. running, I mean, event. we've had him on yeah. the podcast before, but this this is the first time like we were. I, I met him, and did you? I thought he was going to be a, a taller guy. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of felt made me feel good, honestly. <laughs> like I think we were about the same height. Maybe he's Probably. a little taller than me. No, I think I think you're. But fine. he definitely looked a hundred times cooler than me. I'll give him that. He looks very cool. <laughs> he's got. It's cool. hard to compare. Yeah. To Bryce. Plus, you throw yeah. in the accent. Yeah, it's, it's game <laughs> over right can't there. That. Yeah. yeah. So you guys worked with them and they did they hook you up with gear and uh, Yeah. I mean they were already really supportive before that. Uh we have uh we have a mutual friend, Sam Veldy, who lives in California, who manages a lot of bands and um he hooked me up with like Bryce and Tommy and a couple other people oh, yeah. who work there and they sent us a couple things and like at the time I wasn't running, but I like any athletic gear because I go to the gym um, when I'm drumming, I used to play in like gym shorts a lot, stuff that's breathable. So I enjoy the, the tech of that stuff and it looks really cool. And I appreciated like their curation or all their visuals. Um, but then when I started running, I like went and found the satisfy stuff and I was like, Oh my gosh, this stuff is amazing. Like I didn't realize it was like so perfectly made, uh, for running. So that's like, those are the only shorts yeah. I wear and like now that's cold. I, I like I got the gloves and I haven't actually worn the gloves yet because it hasn't been that cold. But uh, I wear the shirts and like I, I got the the Hoka uh, oh, nice. collab shoes. Is that the one you're wearing? Cool. Yeah, Is that the one? <laughs> they're so cool. They I love awesome. them. That's really cool. I, I didn't wear them because you were going to be here. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did want to bring but before I forget it because we were talking about you growing up drumming in DC. I felt like the story, 
story reminds me a lot of Dave Grohl because I read... Isn't he from this area? Yeah, he's from D.C. And I read his book, and it was kind of the same thing where he was just obsessed with drumming. Couldn't... All, that's all he wanted to do. He told his mom that he's like... like Because he, he dropped out of, I think, high school to go um, tour. And that was... Just I felt like there's a lot of parallels with how much that was his like life vision was drumming. Like he couldn't think of anything else once it was in his life. Mm. I don't know. But have you ever have you read his book? No, uh, I haven't. That sounds like the perfect should, audiobook to listen to while oh, running. Dude, you, so I'm It's have so to good. That. You have to read it. I'm an audiobook yeah. guy myself. Yeah. Part They're of so that, good for runs. Well, it's also yeah. good because the thing we were talking about earlier with I can't sit still and read a book. I yeah. two things happen. I either start thinking about other stuff or I fall asleep. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I feel you. It's like they're they're really good to fall asleep with a lot of the time. But like, yeah, I mean, unless it's like some classic literature and the prose is beautiful, then I feel like it should be enjoyed. Uh, actual read, like reading it. Okay. But otherwise, like, yeah, it's just logistically it's harder to find the right time and headspace to read. And when you can multitask and do other things. Um, why not? Do yeah, that? there's no, there's only a few so many hours in the day. That's funny that you mentioned the pros and classic because I was thinking about it because it was one of these things came by on Instagram and it was somebody reciting some Shakespeare mm-hmm. and I was like, wow, that's actually a really beautiful thought. I hadn't really digested it that way before, and I was like, should I get should I get a book to uh, you know get one of the Shakespeare uh, plays and read it or is it meant to be seen as a play? Should I uh, mm-hmm. l- either listen to it? auditory or maybe you know uh, watch an actual reproduction of it not mm-hmm. not like uh mm-hmm. the ones with Leonardo the, DiCaprio yeah not that <laughs> <laughs> but like that's a good point yeah. where do you fall on that one Robbie uh I'm okay with either because I've I've done both but I think reading it you, reading it is actually pretty enjoyable for Shakespeare because you get to see the kind of the wordplay that he does like you can appreciate the because he plays a, 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 like with double meanings and stuff like double that. Double entendre. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> he loves it. I didn't want to throw that out there. Wait, what's that <laughs> other word? Homonyms, phrase. right? Um, Where it's the same word same, that means uh, the bricks right. that are over by the. the yeah, aquarium. sounds the same, yeah. but yeah. Um, Look at us you, <laughs> teaching people. <laughs> and, but it's uh yeah, but I I think either way works, which is why he's such a genius, is because even though he wrote it for stage. Reading it is equally is impressive. enjoyable. Yeah, mm. yeah. Right. but uh, yeah, I <laughs> and feel that's you. your I, moment I, with reading and running. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like during the COVID lockdown, I read so much. Like Pat from Turnstile, um, he reads a lot, and we had like a book club for a while, and I had another book club, and I was like, "Dude, this sounds unlike Motley Crue." <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little Dude, that's unlike awesome. Motley Crue. Yeah, but like since then. Life has been so busy and there's been so much movement. Mm. I've read like two or three books in those like whatever, like two and a half. I don't even know how long it's yeah. been. Yeah. Uh, and everything else has been like audiobook or like I'll start a book uh, and then I'll just be like, I'm a quarter of the way through it. I'm just going to switch to audiobook because like I want to, I don't want to wait for the time or the headspace. I just want to like do this while I'm running or whatever. I can't tell how many books I've gotten three quarters of the way through and just been like, (laughs) over. When when I used to tour, but this was before we had smartphones and it was all, I would just go to the library before a tour and just, check out like 10 books and then over never the, return over the course of, yeah <laughs> they're mine now and then over the course of a month we just the whole band would cycle through the you know i don't know all 10 books and that was the most i ever read in my life was just oh that's cool reading books because we had nothing else to do like you know like before a show when you after he's you sat, on a tour bus that has video no, but you know what it was like when but like when you bef- out of the van and you sound check and you have like three hours before you play a show it's like what yeah. else are you gonna do except for drink or like in your case, not drink. <laughs> no, I mean, that's a good point. Yeah. Cause like that is how you, you need your like extracurricular activities or else. Yeah. You just default to like, Oh, I'll just, is there alcohol on the rider? I'll just <laughs> do I have drink tickets. I'll just drink <laughs> for a while. Like it's just normal. Like yeah. I, I understand that. And like, similarly, if you don't have something that you're like actively seeking out, you just default to like, yeah, I'll just like be scrolling on my phone for hours on end right uh so it's it's nice to have other things to do. it's nice to have books to read that seems like the best yeah. use of time 
I think my favorite was when we'd <laughs> be driving between cities and like we had a bunk bed and like a bench seat along the side and then some one person had to lay on the floor and you'd just be reading a book, laying on the floor on a sleeping bag and then you're kind of hungover and then you just like fall asleep to the hum of the road. <laughs> and it's like, oh, yeah, it's like the nice. best nap ever, which you probably know because you guys uh, sleep from city to city when you're traveling on a bus so mm -hmm. you get that and you're yeah. like in a coffin on the bus oh yeah and i've <laughs> done so like we've only recently had the bus and then before that had like this bandwagon which is like a converted box truck that oh, was yeah kind of a bus experience but like extremely bumpy and there's no suspension and like, <laughs> oh, and man, that's, that's a crazy experience but like yeah before that it was years and years and years of uh touring in a van and like you know for better, for worse, it's like, it's great. Like you, that's some of the best like quality time I've just had with people like just in general, like the, I, I'm like a night person. So I mm -hmm. do, I would do a lot of the night drives oh, and yeah. some of the best uh, and most interesting conversations I've had that are just like, there's no sense of time and like kind of with running, you're just both like you and the person shotgun and whoever else is just kind of like staring towards this like, open expanse of road and you just get in this different headspace and it becomes like kind of like trancey and like meditative um and then i crash into a tree like when you're going down <laughs> yeah. towards south carolina and this this is did you oh man you're making me all nostalgic now man that is the best like seriously that is the best yeah like, you can't replace it I, I do miss that and it was like the coolest way to listen to music too oh, when there's yeah. like the full van full of people and you got like the aux cord and like you're, you're DJing and uh, yeah, it's just, it, it's really special. So I, I do miss that. I don't miss like being chronically sleep deprived, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. yeah, your naps are really good when you're chronically sleep deprived. They that feel great. True. Instant REM. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Uh, all right. Anyway. I have to say that in this day and age, and we're probably getting ready to wrap up, but in this day, day and age, like I used to know everything about the bands I listened to. I used to go, you know, like I would pull out the papers, read all the lyrics, anything that they provided with it. I'd know the whole playlist on front and back of if it was now yeah. or a CD, you know, everything that was on there. And I feel like now we've gone to Spotify where it's like you hear a song that you like and that might be the only song that you experience from that band. You might just mm. be like, oh, I, I like that. There's only a couple of modern bands that have resonated enough that I like enjoy like a lot of their uh, music from different albums and from specific albums. And uh, I have to say Turnstile is definitely one of those ones that has fallen into that. Like, I don't want to just know a song or have a song on my playlist from it. It's like, it's a band that like, it's really good. Uh, yeah, I feel the same way. I especially felt like Lil' On is just a cohesive album where I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of times now people don't really put, they just, release patchwork single i know it was like a shorter album but it's like but a lot of times people now you just they trickle out singles and then throw together an album at the end of that cycle or whatever which is just not the same as mm -hmm. that it's like a meaningful collection of songs and i'm not even that into like hardcore or anything i like my other one i would probably say bayonne is is a band that i like even brother tiger you know it's like Oh, I can listen to multiple songs and enjoy it. And I, I don't find that there's a lot of music right now where you can. It's usually they're making yeah. that one song or something. That Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Do you feel like since you guys have been so successful, and I think a large reason of that is because you're what you were saying, you're, you don't keep it confined to a certain genre. You just do it. It feels awesome and feels, you know, what you're doing your best creatively. But do you feel, and I think that's what resonates with a lot of people, but do you, since that resonates with so many people now, do you feel like there's... Expectation? Not necessarily an expectation, but as you know, with any group of people that have like a hardcore scene, especially people with indie scenes, stuff like that, once you get big, it's like, oh man, they're like selling out. They're like playing arenas now with Blink. Like I remember being in the pit at you know sidebar or whatever <laughs> at like, clifton park like, yeah <laughs> or wait what's, um, the, what's the one right here that everybody goes to um uh, which one uh, right off charleston not charleston but at maryland ave or whatever 
Autobar. Autobar. Oh, Autobar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, obviously. Um, <laughs> but like, do you feel like that's been a little bit of a struggle? Or are you just like, are, or I, I feel like your true fans are really like still on board, ride or die. Um, yeah, there, there, there seem to be a, a lot of people that have like followed Turnstile and listened to the music and come to shows that are like overwhelmingly positive and yeah. supportive. I, I feel really lucky that there is so much community that just like it embraces the band as people and all like the choices that we make, all the creative liberties that we take, whether or not that might seem like stepping away from um, kind of like a purist um, look at like, oh, this is what hardcore is supposed to be. And and now you're like departing from it. Does that feel like betrayal? Like, I I don't think um, people have, have like reacted that way they seem generally um just like happy for us making music that we like Mm -hmm. and i think that resonates in a way um where sometimes new music will come out and they'll be like kind of confused by it at first and then come around and be like oh okay well this is not what i expected um and this is not maybe it doesn't fit in the genre that i expected Mm -hmm but I like it for whatever reason, something yeah. resonates. And like, so I think that's all that matters. Um, uh, but yeah, th- there's probably a larger conversation to be had too about how music is so varied nowadays and, and people in general, I think just like to c- celebrate success. Um, if that's the right word for other people and people making their own, like, bands and booking tours and like making podcasts and you know just going about any form of like publishing ideas or music or anything creative um people like to be happy for other people and i feel i feel like it's gotten better since i feel like in the 90s it was like (laughs) you were actually a sell like the word sellout was like a real thing where it was well here's the thing whereas now it's like if you look at music has changed so i think at one point there was a limited amount of resources to hear your music, you had to make it on the radio. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people competing for that space. Mm-hmm. Now you can go and you can make an album, put it out there, and you find your audience and you can, whether it's through putting it online or doing concerts or whatever, and people are going to discover you. So I don't think the competitiveness there or the jealousy of, okay, Turnstile is killing it right now. They can go on tour. Yeah, my band... Maybe not there yet, but I can see, okay, this is how they did it. And I could follow that path and, and hopefully. Yeah. I, I think too, like in the same way, like in the nineties, you know, because you didn't have social media or internet mm-hmm. or anything, you were like, if you followed a band from when they were small, you actually felt like that was That's my band. Like I, <laughs> I met them in person, which is crazy to think. Whereas now like you could hit someone up on Instagram and from across the country and feel like you know them where in the 90s you had to literally like drive four hours of that show yeah you know? and so when they put out that disco album you're like yeah <laughs> like damn it I, I do understand that like yeah not 90s definitely had the hater area era of like people <laughs> being like accused of being sell out and just like really going from loved to hated like this really like passionate like flip-flop but i do understand that like it like, was because it was so intimate to people yeah. it was so like close to people mm-hmm. that they felt betrayed and whether or not I, I agree with that what betrayal well how that was defined for them well i think and, when like, you two put their whole album on the on the iphone <laughs> oh yeah that was, that was over <laughs> yeah that was as far <laughs> as you could sell out actually yeah. they, they set the standard for selling out yeah. <laughs> they really did uh, to the point where it became the most annoying thing in the world <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's still you two on like my, yeah, my devices. Some, you can't escape it. Yeah, it's inevitable. <laughs> it was basically virus spamware for <laughs> yeah. for music. <laughs> well, Daniel, it was super nice of you to come in. Like we are huge fans, obviously. I, I think you can tell. And it is really like for us when talking about fanning out. You guys are from Baltimore. Probably my favorite band from Baltimore. I would say I do love Beach House too. Oh, yeah, Beach <laughs> House would be my, future, my number one. Future Islands, yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah, Future um, Islands. The but 
Look, it, it means a lot to us that you came down. We're totally excited that you found running and that hopefully you love it as much as we do. And, you know, if you need anything at all, we're here. Can I ask you one more question? Um, Cause I need to find out and I, maybe other people want <laughs> to I'm going to see if he says no to ask him one <laughs> yeah. more question. We'll find no. out. <laughs> okay. yeah, I'm done. <laughs> um, the headphones on. <laughs> is the song that was on, I think you should leave. Is that ever going to come out? Oh no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Ah, dude, that's maybe you should record it, that. Robbie. <laughs> sometimes I just listen. Sometimes I just watch the show to listen to that clip and I'm like, this will surely they will put this song out. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad yeah. you like it. Hey, okay. That was so fun to do. And maybe I'll show you the full song after this. I'll oh, play, okay. play you the Sweet. MP3. Are they, Wait, you'll play it or <laughs> give it to him. Yeah, no, <laughs> give it to him. So I, I can't can drop it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Wait, so did you, how did that and it happen anyways? Um, Tim Robinson, who was like, yeah. you know, main writer and creator and everything. Um, Are you sure about that? <laughs> no. You sure about that? <laughs> um, yeah. I'm sure about that's why. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he's, he's been friends uh, with us and like everyone in the band. We've had lots of mutual friends uh, okay. in LA uh, for a while and he's come to a lot of shows, um, him and his son and... Um, yeah, we're all massive fans <laughs> yeah. of, of the show and other shows and other things that he've done, he's done in the past. Um, so I'm just glad like there was an opening because it was like while they were like uh, writing and, and filming that season, um, yeah, he hit us up and Dude, that's so e cool. explained the skit <laughs> and everything. Yeah, it was super cool. And we had, had never done anything like that. Yeah. before so brand new experience for all of us and it was like the perfect first experience for like doing something specifically for a show and not just for a show but like for a skit and you know it's like it's comedy and like you know if you listen to the lyrics it's uh <laughs> it, it's it was it's hard to like key in on something that was like supposed to sound like a rock band, like an angsty <laughs> anti rules yeah. uh, kind of rock band <laughs> and fit the comedy of the skit and just match the energy of the show. So yeah, yeah it, it was great to do. Uh, it worked perfectly. That's right. I feel like that and the, um, the vampire weekend song from the, oh, the, the other, yeah. yeah. Sloppy steaks episode was, I love that too. Yeah. <laughs> all right, cool. I think that's uh that about wraps it up then. Yeah. Thank all you right. for having me. Yeah. Thanks yeah, so much for coming, for coming in. in.